Hi, everybody. How you doing? So uh, this is yet another installment of our Q class. Uh, whoop, whoop. Have a little repraise there. Um, thanks for coming. Um, uh, just so you know, before we start, it's always good to have a pair of headphones, strongly recommended. And I guess uh, we will put it on speaker view. I forgot to ask Carlos. Carlos, do people put it on, keep it on speaker view, I guess? Yeah. Um, and uh, we're going to have uh, questions at the end. Um, so today, uh, this is, I'm, I'm really super looking forward to this. Today we have um, our very own Pete Calandra, straight off the DNC, Democratic National Convention, wrote the music, produced it, the whole thing for the first three nights. So we welcome our very own, um, our very own Pete. And uh, thank you so much. I'm not even sure what that music was we just heard. Uh, um, but before we get to that, um, so today is just about uh, learning how to collaborate online. So what Pete did was already we're we're a little ahead of you guys. So he he we lo loaded something into the chat that you can download to keep for yourself. Uh, that's just information on some different platforms. And um, Pete, we're going to jump right in. What was the music we were just listening to? I forgot to ask you about oh, that. That was a track of mine called "The Cat's Eye" from my 2017 album, "The Road Home." Fantastic. Recorded in my apartment in New York City, the whole thing. In the whole thing in the apartment. <laughs> cool. So here we go. So Pete, you can take it away. Okay. So before I start the presentation, on my screen here, you'll see I've got a PDF and it's got some resources. So we've got that in the chat room. You should download this. I can't teach you GarageBand, Audacity, or Reaper. And those are the three pieces of software if you're going to assemble an online collaboration that I would recommend. GarageBand is free. It comes with every Mac. Audacity is free. You can download it. It's for Mac or PC. 
Reaper is for Mac or PC, and it's very inexpensive for a lifetime license. And I'm actually starting to learn how to use Reaper myself because I'm pondering leaving Pro Tools because I'm not happy with Avid, the company that owns Pro Tools, but that's another story. So download this. There's links to tutorials for all these things, and you'll have to do a little bit of work studying this stuff on your own. Um, I can't teach you how to sequence, but what I will teach you to do is how to make what you can do better, or at least I'll show you methods to make things better. So first off, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the artistry and collaborative efforts of professors Morelli, Robinson, McCrell, and Blanco. Their fabulous work made this project a joy to work on. So we've recorded two pieces of music collaboratively and we've documented that and we have videos of that to play for you guys. So now the most important thing to remember as far as I'm concerned to ensure a successful online collaboration is to prepare. And I have a saying that I tell my students that they're probably sick of hearing some semesters, but I've learned it a long time ago and I've used it in my own work, right? And it is failing to prepare is preparing to fail. If you don't prepare, the likelihood of you actually doing something is, is negligible, you know? So it sounds a little corny, but it really works. And the more you prepare, the greater your chances of success are. For example, if you're a pianist and you can't play in all 12 keys and you think you're going to go out into the world and make a living accompanying singers, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. If you're going to record a piece of music and you haven't practiced and rehearsed the piece of music so that you can play it cold perfectly, you're going to be in for a, most likely a rude awakening. So preparation exists on multiple levels simultaneously. You prepare your piece of music to play, you study your instrument, you're preparing. Running a successful recording session also takes preparation. You don't just show up and expect magic to happen unless you are incredibly gifted and incredibly experienced. So for example, in the 1960s and 1970s, session musicians could show up at a recording studio never having heard a piece of music, get a chord chart, talk through everything, and maybe rehearse a couple of times, and boom, create a million, million selling record for a great vocalist or a great artist. That only worked because they had spent a whole career preparing. They were great musicians, great engineers, and they did it every day for years. So they did their preparing on the job. For us mere mortals, which is myself and all of us, it's incredibly beneficial to organize your recording session. Now, this starts with picking a piece of music that will work in online collaboration for your level of experience. I would suggest to start out with an easier piece of music that can be played to a click track, right? You want to get used to doing this. You don't want to just jump into something that's incredibly complex, incredibly difficult, and try to put it all together at your first attempt for doing this, right? I would also suggest doing a piece of music that is no longer than a couple of minutes in length. Right? We're not going to be able to perform the Rite of Spring first thing we do, just not possible. You also would be beneficial to you to figure out the hierarchy for recording. You need to be a team. If you've got three or four people, you have to organize and assign tasks. One person really needs to be the point person who organizes and doles out responsibilities. One person should be assembling the tracks into the DAW, which would be GarageBand, Reaper, or Audacity. And another gets the music to the players, organizes when, who's going to finish something, when, when they're going to finish it, organizes the folders online with which you, where you share things. So 
Now, for what we hope to achieve this year, GarageBand, Audacity, and Reaper will be more than sufficient for assembling the music. In my presentation, I'm going to be using Pro Tools because that's the software I know the best. But everything I do in these Pro Tools sessions can be done in e either of those pieces of software. You'll have to take some time and have to learn the basics if you don't know them already. And those YouTube links tutorials will help you. A couple of things. You need to have one tuning standard. If there's a piano, the piano should play the A above middle C, let it sustain out, play a D minor chord in root position with that A on above middle C, let it sustain out, and just make a recording of that that everybody can tune up to. Everybody has a tuner. You probably have a tuner in your phone and you think the tuners are digital and that they're all the same. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a professional recording session where everybody tunes with their own tuner and yet the tracks are out of tune. So just have one reference for tuning. It sounds crazy, but it's true. And then another reference you need to have is something that will keep everyone in time. This could be a click track, or as we'll see in the rhythm section track that we'll be playing later, a good, strong drummer that everybody references for the time. And if you're recording a chamber piece with no piano or continuo, it's best practice to record, if possible, from the lowest pitched instrument first to the highest pitched instrument. This way you've got a really strong fundamental pitch with which everyone can tune off of. That also means that you need to pick a mu piece of music where there's a fair amount of low note information and not a lot of rests where the, it only plays a little bit. So again, picking the material that you're going to record will be very, at, at our level of expertise, will be very essential in making the session run smoothly and making a successful recording. Now, Planning out a good piece to record online is essential, especially to get started. Preparation, preparation, preparation. And I'm serious about that. I'm sounding like a broken record, but it's so true. So in 2015, I went into Avatar Studios, which is now the power station at Berkeley. It's in the theater, sort of in Hell's Kitchen Theater District area. And I recorded the, the world, uh, Special Olympics World Games theme that I wrote for ESPN. And I want to show you what I did for that. Let's see. Let me just get this. Okay, great. Everybody can see my desktop, right? Sounds good. Okay. Yes. So the first thing we did was we got a PDF of the studio. Suddenly I can't hear you. Somehow I got muted. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. All right. So the first thing we did was we got a PDF of the studio. We hired 19 musicians. We hired six trumpets, uh, four French horns, three tenor trombones, three bass trombones, and a tuba. And they were going to be playing to my pre-recorded tracks. So the engineer and I got together. And this is for a professional recording session, right? And we put in where everybody was going to sit. First trumpet is the right here. First horn was over here. And then we had our three tenor trombones and two bass trombones. And as an aside, I hired two of my Queens College classmates, uh, Jack Schatz and Charlie Gordon, to play bass trombone and tenor trombone. So we all stick together, us Queens College people. <laughs> Um, and they did a great job. Then these black things are where the microphones were. This is the conductor's stand. This little contraption here is something called a decatree mic, which is three microphones. 
it's beyond the scope of our presentation, but it's used a lot in classical music to record stereo. This is, these mics here are outrigger mics. We had three microphones on the trumpets, two microphones on the trombones, two microphones behind the French horns, which I wasn't crazy about the sound of that when we got in the room. So we quickly put two more microphones in front of them and one microphone for the tuba, right? So we planned it out in advance. We had a discussion, the engineer and I, as to how the alignment of the instruments would fit best with my pre-recorded MIDI tracks that they were going to be playing on top of. Next, right? The engineer picked the microphones. So we knew in advance what microphones we were going to be using where. And these are all, I, I could tell you what these are, but they're they're all for the, you know, these Coles microphones, they're ribbon mics, they're for the trombones, right? These um, 160s, they're uh, biodynamic ribbon mics, C24s, they're uh, AKG omnidirectional mics. So, so they're for stereo. So um, now they might be cardioid, I forget, but they were for the, out, for the wide right angle stereo. All right, so we did that. Then what I did was I put together a PDF, so I have it with me, because there were issues with the score that I wanted to be able to rehearse, right? I didn't want to just play through things. We had a finite amount of time and we had a budget, and this was a lot, costing a lot of money per minute, you know, um, like $120 per minute to run the session. So if I have to make a 10 minute mistake, that's $1,000 out of my pocket, right? So it's best to be organized. So I have notes about performance questions. I have, you know, notes for in specific instruments for the different versions of the theme because there were about five or six versions we had to record. And so that's that. And then additionally, since I have got a long history of playing on Broadway keyboards, I'm used to having scripts and no show notes and run of show to guide rehearsals. So I put together a whole schedule. And you have to be a little flexible with these things because stuff happens and you have to be able to go with it, but it's best to be really prepared before you walk into the studio. And this whole session went really beautifully, really well. My ESPN clients were really happy and I made my other clients that got me on that gig look good. And that's all that really matters. So the first th piece that we're gonna work on is um, a Handel Trio Sonata played by Professor Frank Morelli on bassoon, Professor Chris De Robinson on oboe, and I played the continuo part. And um, we're gonna listen to an MP3 of the final mix. And then we're gonna watch an assembly video and you can see how we worked on this. So Carlos, if you could play the first track, the first file, I'm gonna mute myself here.
All right. So I thought that went really well. It sounded pretty good to me. Um, I'm the weak link there <laughs> on the performance part. But notice that it ticked all the bases that I talked about before. A minute to two minutes long, steady tempo. We played to a click track. I played the piano first. Then Professor Morelli played the bassoon parts, and then Professor Robinson played the oboe parts, and I assembled everything. So if we can play our handle assembly video, um, O2, Carlos, that would be great, and I will catch you after that's over. One of the first things that I would suggest you do if you are going to do a project like this is to create a reference click track that everybody will play to. I'm going to do this in Pro Tools because that's the software I work in, but you can do this in GarageBand, you can do this in Audacity, in Logic, whatever software you have, the basic idea is the same. So I'm gonna create a new session and I'm gonna, this will be my master session for everything and I'm gonna title it with today's date and my initials. I'm gonna save it to my desktop. This piece is at 60 beats per minute. And we're in 3-4. So I'm going to set all that up. Now, there are two ways of getting the click track out of Pro Tools. I can have my click track turned on and have it set to play during both play and record. So that means when it's just playing back, it'll sound. You can hear it playing back right now. And I don't like that sound, so I'm gonna change it to something I like better, which is this Yuri Click preset I've got. This is what I'm used to in real recording studios. That's a nice sound because it won't leak out of your headphones as easily, and it's more pleasant on your ears when you're listening. All right, so that's playing back. So I'm gonna select more time than I need, right? This piece is just a couple of minutes long at the most. So I'm gonna select much more time than that. I'm selecting a little over four minutes, and then I'm going to bounce this to disk or export it, right? And you need to name this as well. Click 60 BPM. Everything needs to be labeled. And I'm gonna bounce this. And if I go to my desktop, here we are. Here's our bounced files. And if I play this back, we should hear a click track. Great. Now, another way to do this, which is a little bit more cumbersome, is create a new track, a mono audio track. Click. Set the output for a bus. Set the input for that bus. Hit record. And then just let it record. And you could see here that on my way audio file, make that big, you can see that it's recording the click. I'm in my living room right now, and I've got that session that I created loaded into my laptop with my click track set up. I've got an audio track in here, and I've named it Piano. Very important when you put a track into your DAW, whatever it is, that before you record anything, that you name it. Very important, because it will automatically name the audio file, and it's just much better for file management. Now I'm all set up. I've got my Yeti over here set up. I've got my level set on the Yeti. I've got, a... it's not the optimal way for recording a piano, but for our purposes, it'll be fine. It's above the hammers, it's pointed semi down towards the strings. It it's, will sound fine for this project. I've got my sheet music set up. I've got my headphones here. I've, I've practiced, I've done a little, demo recording to make sure that everything sounds good before I do a take. 
and I'm ergonomically set up here. I've got my headphones, right? They're not really in my way too badly for playing. And I'm just using earbuds from my iPhone, it's fine. And I'm gonna hit record on the computer. I'm gonna listen to three beats up front because we're in three, four. So it'll be one, two, three. On the second measure of click, I'm going to clap on the downbeat and that will give me a sync point. This way, it'll give us a little bit of a reference point when we're lining things up and assembling the project later. You'll still maybe have to slide things around a little bit, but it will give you a nice idea as to where to put your audio files and how to line things up. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna make sure I'm at the beginning and I'm gonna hit record. Okay, so I finished an acceptable take. Took me a couple of tries. Even though it's not that difficult, there are a few things that I wanted to do a little bit better. I'm going to save this session, then upload it back to the Google Drive, put it back in my computer, and do a screen sharing and show you what I'll do with the files. So join me in my studio. <laughs> that was my dog flapping her ears. So now I'm back in my studio, and the reason I'm here and not on my laptop is that I'm much more used to making screen recordings and tutorials on this computer than my laptop. You can perfectly do what I'm doing here on any laptop that you might have right now. As a matter of fact, the computer that I recorded this on is a 2012 MacBook Pro that I can record 60 or 70 tracks of audio on no problem. So I've got my piano track here. There's my clap. Great, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of this and I've turned the click off and I'm making sure that it is not clicking during play and record. And I'm just going to export this on Pro Tools and this is handle, piano, only. Gonna bounce that, okay, good. And I recorded the click as audio you could turn on the click like this so that it's during play and record. Before I render this, I want to see how loud the click is versus the piano. So that seems pretty loud. I think that's a bit obnoxious, so I'm gonna bring the volume of that down a little bit here. To be honest with you, Frank and Krista probably don't even need the click. Um, so I'm gonna bring it down a little bit more. So I'm gonna render this. That seems fine. I'm gonna go a little further. Uh, handle piano, click. Okay. And I will render this. So I've got these three files here and I'm just gonna double check that they sound. That's just the click. Here's just the piano only. Great, and piano click. Great, I've got all three and I'm gonna highlight all three. I'm gonna right click and I'm going to compress these three items. So I've compressed these three items and I'm gonna name them handle, piano, and click. So since I'm gonna be doing two projects, I want to make a new folder. Handle, master, folder. Right, 
And I'm just going to drag all this stuff into there. And take this guy here. Drag it in. All right, and then I'm going to share this. Get a shareable link. Copy link. And I'll send this off to the other two participants, Frank and Krista, and they will do their job. They'll be making little videos, and I'm going to edit this all together. And I'll be back after that to show you how to put it all together. For this handle recording, I used my iPhone 8 with a, an attached Zoom IQ6 microphone. And I use voice memo. And thanks to Professor Calandra, I knew to make to choose lossless. You go to settings in your iPhone, you go to the voice memos, and you can either have compressed or lossless for sound. So I did it with uh, lossless. Uh, we made a pretty good sound. Here is our music room, which is quite big. And often I'm using it with a mic far away from me when I'm playing by myself. Uh, but what I did in this case, because after our the lecture, we heard the other Q class from uh, Professor Calandra, I set up in a corner and used a lot of sound absorbing materials. I set up sort of to the side of the piano in a corner where I could close drapes on either side. There's also some furniture that got shoved there because I was, you know, moving things around. And there's also a quilt. My wife happens to be a quilt maker. And uh, so I have these beautiful quilts to absorb sound as well as the rug on the floor and a chair in front of me. Three feet away, so you can see where the bassoon is pretty much where I would have been sitting and holding it. And then over there, you can see a tripod over there. And that's where the microphone was. So it was three feet off the ground and off the floor and three feet away from my tone holes. And that's the way in which I recorded the music you're hearing that has been mixed together. All right, so I just received the files back from Frank and Professor Morelli, and I'm going to import them into Pro Tools. So audio, and I'll go to downloads, and I'll select these two, and I'm going to convert them because they have to be converted to my file format. And here we go. I'll mark the second measure of click. Great, so that's the second measure of click. So I'm just going to cut the audio there and delete. And then I'll do the same thing here, which is probably right there. First note of the set, first beat of second bar of click. One. And that's right there. And I may have to do a little bit of sliding things around. So that's the bassoon solo and the bassoon bass. So let's move the solo so that it's above the piano and the bass so that it's above the piano but below the other one. So now if I take this and drag this here, I'm just going to ballpark it right now and then I'll zoom in and make things closer. And let me make these bigger so that I can see them. So I'd say it's probably like that and like that. So I'm going to probably have to slide these around to get them to line up. But let's mute the bass and we'll do the solo. So I'm going to slide it so that it starts right on the beat there. And the same with this. All right, so the way I'm able to see that is I'm lining it up with the first note of the piano, right? And I can slide the piano so that it starts right on that grid so that we're all starting in the same spot.
Great. So I'll work on making this sound better once I get the uh, elbow, but let me clean up the end here. We don't want to send off stuff. And I'm going to make a mix of this. Let's see, what I think I'll do is, I know that Krista has Reaper that she's using, so I'm going to just make her audio files of each individual instrument. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select everything from the beginning, right? So that all of our audio files are the same length. So we're starting everything right at the beginning, and then I'm going to bounce this. And then I'm going to upload that and send it off to Krista, and then she'll be able to import everything, all four tracks, into her computer, have everything start at measure one. Hello, everyone. Krista Robinson here, and I'm sitting in my home recording studio. Uh, like many of us will be doing this fall, and I'm getting ready to collaborate uh, with some other faculty at the Aaron Copeland School. So I am the new oboe faculty member, and uh, I'm happy to work on this project to hopefully help some of you do this at home too. I'm gonna to pause here and then I'm gonna show you my home studio setup. All right, so here's a picture of my home studio setup and you can see that I've got a Reaper session open and I downloaded the tracks that were sent to me uh, that um, Professor Frank Morelli had sent as well um, to play along with. And here's my microphone setup. I'm trying out this new ribbon microphone and I have it about two feet away from my oboe. Um, I'm also using an audio interface, the SSL, and I keep my music on a tablet. So that's my setup for home. Um, and I've got my headphones on and ready to start the session. So I'm back in Pro Tools and Krista has sent me the oboe files. So I'm gonna import those. So I've navigated to my desktop, to the handle master folder and it's in files for Krista, handle oboe. And I'm going to copy so that it's in my Pro Tools session. Hit done, open and then new track at the session start. And let's see, so Krista did this in Reaper. So if you notice, her track lines up perfectly because she exported everything as a single file from beginning to end. It's a little long, but that's okay, not a problem. That can easily be taken care of. And let's take a listen here. That yeah, sounds great. All right, so let me just double check that everything's lined up and this is gonna be a little loud, so I'm gonna turn the volume down. Great, I'm going to start a new video now where I mix all of these elements together and do some treatment to it. And for that, I'm going to set up a few things in my studio and have a better audio quality for that so you can really hear it. Okay, so um, let me, yeah. So one thing is you can see that I used a USB microphone, Professor Morelli used a phone, and Professor Robinson used an audio interface and a DAW, which is Reaper, and a, and a nice microphone. So you could, whatever you have, you'll have to figure out a way to make it all work. And that's why we do the sync clap on the beginning of the bar before you start playing. And it makes it so that if you're just doing it on your phone, I have a reference or whoever's gonna be assembling this has a reference to start things on the downbeat. And you saw, I just had to slide things around a little bit. I would suggest though, that it's a sharp sound. So if you, you have your hands on your instrument or something, you can just tap on a table and make a little, a sharp sound that makes a nice sharp transient at the beginning, which makes it a little bit easier to line up. Okay, so let's go on to the next video, please, Carlos. Carlos helping us out, doing a great job here with the technical stuff. I'm back now for this portion of the video and I've got things set up a little better for better audio here so that when you review this later on YouTube hopefully you'll be able to hear with earbuds in better than just the zoom audio quality so let's just take a play of this
one thing I want to do here is order my tracks properly. So what I'm doing now is I'm dragging the oboe so that it's on the top and this piano I need to hide. I don't need to see that. And I don't need to see the click anymore. Great. Or the click track. Now, the first thing is that the oboe and the bassoon are both stereo tracks. You can see that there's a double waveform on these. There's nothing wrong with that in the big picture of things. It just makes it a little bit more cumbersome to get an exact panning because in Pro Tools, you have to move two faders. If you're using Logic or GarageBand, it just has the a knob that you pan left and right. So what I would typically do for these tracks here, and the piano is in stereo. I did record that in stereo. So I would just highlight these, and I would split these into mono, right? Great. And then I would just go about uh, getting rid of the ones that I don't need. That's a little bit better for me. I'm going to pan this now as an ensemble. Now, there's two ways of going about this, right? We've got the upper voice, the soprano voice, which is the oboe. We have a bassoon, which would be maybe the tenor voice or the alto voice. And then we've got the lower bassoon, which is the bass line. There's two ways you can go about this panning. And, and then you have the continuo. You can think of a stage and how you would see them on the stage. So typically the keyboard player, because the lid of the keyboard would be open, would be on the left-hand side of the stage. And then you would pan the instruments. You'd have to figure something out left to right. So let's take a quick listen to what that would sound like. So I am going to pan the piano a little bit to the left. I'm going to take the lower bassoon and keep it, it a little bit to, to the Let's see, I'm going to keep the bassoon in the center and I'll pan the second bassoon a little bit to the right and the, the oboe, I'm going to keep that in the center. So maybe I'll, I'll pan one of the bassoons a little bit to the left and the piano a little bit more. And so let's take a quick listen to that. Piano is too loud now, so I'll bring the volume down. That's okay, and that might be what you want. For me, personally, the way I would do this would be I would keep the piano in stereo. I would keep the oboe in the middle since it's the soprano voice, or I would pan the oboe a little bit to one side. I'd pan the solo bassoon a little bit to the opposite side, and I would keep the bass bassoon in the middle. So let's take a listen to that. See... To me, that sounds, already, I can tell that that sounds so much better because it's more balanced, right? You've got more of a, an even soundstage left to right. And obviously, you can't hear this on Zoom, but if you go and review this later on YouTube, you'll be able to hear that. So I'm going to mute the piano right now, and I'm just going to listen to the woodwinds, and I'm going to make sure that I've got a good balance So I turned down the, the bassoon solo just a little bit. And I'm going to turn up. And turn the bassoon up a little bit. Beautiful. Everybody's playing beautifully. Right, so the bassoon solo, I mean, the, the oboe solo, I mean, I turned that up a little bit. That's the main focus for me as a, as a listener. just a little too hot. Great. And the other thing too is to scrub your tracks. So I no longer need all this count in stuff. So I'm just going to highlight this, hold the shift key down in Pro Tools and probably in any other DAW and delete that. And then what I'm going to do is zoom in and just make a little fade in, which I can do this way just by selecting those. And in Pro Tools, it would be just hitting the F key. You have to research in your DAW to see how to do that. So 
So the continuo, I think, can be brought down a little bit. Right, and the way you would do that is, I, I've got the volume all the way up. There's one of two ways to do this. This is one way. So the volume is back to zero here, and I'm going to play it. And you can hear that it, it's too loud. So as it's playing, I'm holding the fader, and I'm going to close my eyes and just listen. Turn the volume down. The other way to do it is to be do the opposite. So you've got it at no volume, and you do the same thing. You're just listening, bringing the volume up. It's funny. It's about the same as it was before, minus 11.9. Now, a couple of the other things I did with the piano that I want to show you is that I actually made it softer in a few spots, like right here, if I make this bigger for you to see. Right, it says minus 3.8 right there. So I separated out this region. So if I bring the volume up here, you can see the waveforms are much bigger. I played louder because the dynamics were louder, but I didn't have other people to listen to since mine was the reference track, so I played too loud. So I'm going to bring that little clip down. Now, in your DAW, if you don't have this handy feature that Pro Tools has, which is clip-based gain, right, I can put that back to zero. I can go to my volume, and I can double-click on that separated, right? Hold on a second. So I, I pick the area that I want. So from here to here is too loud. So I highlight that area. And then I'll go down here, and then you would just have to find what tool, for me and Pro Tools, it's the trim tool. And I could just click and just drag this down. And you could see in the upper right hand, well, hold on, let me just undo that. As I click and drag down, it lets you know how many dBs you're bringing it down. So I, it was 3.9 worked for me before, so I could do that with volume automation. So either clip gain or volume automation. And I just went through and I balanced out the piano, section by section. Right over here in this one, I've got it at minus 8.5, so that's really softer, but that fit in with... The, I did this with the bassoons before, before I sent this to Krista to play on. Okay, so right here, I'm playing producer, and this is not a criticism of anybody, because if they were playing live, they would be able to communicate this stuff with each other and take care of it. But for me, this long pedal point, this long note here in the lower bassoon is a little too loud. So I'm going to use the clip-based gain to bring that down, or I would just highlight the area that I want to make softer. All right, and then go to my volume and bring it down here this way. Now, what you can do also, and this gets into taste, is you can do a little decrescendo and crescendo towards the end of that note. Right, so right here, I, I can exaggerate so you can really hear it, and I'll solo it. you got to really be careful with this when you're just starting out. Right, and a crescendo back up into it, so I could actually draw it up so that it goes like that. Right, and that's nice. Now, 
Is that correct? I don't know. That's a discussion that you guys would have to have as you're creating this thing. Now, I want to solo these instruments and take a listen to them and listen to the sound. Okay, so Krista used a very nice ribbon microphone and uh, an, an audio interface. So I, I'm feeling like... Now, a ribbon microphone has a very warm and rich sound, and it's really great on brass instruments, uh, electric guitar cabinets. Um, it's very rich sound. It's a little, I want to add some high end, and let me just show you, uh, there's, there's two ways to go about this. Adding EQ is a multi-year study to learn how to do it properly. So what I teach my students is to start off simply. If something is too dark, add what's called a high pass filter. And if something is too bright, add what's called a low pass filter. So a high pass filter just attenuates or brings down the volume of the lower pitched frequencies found in a sound. And a high pass, uh, a low pass filter attenuates the higher pitches that are in a sound. And it's just simple. And you have to listen and develop taste because EQ is a way to control the, vol the, the volumes of harmonics in a sound. Okay, so you can get very specific with different harmonics and different frequencies that are found in a sound, and you can raise or lower the volumes of them. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can destroy the sound. But keeping it simple, if it's too bright, make it a little darker. And if it's too dark, make it a little brighter by subtracting the frequencies that are bothering you rather than adding frequencies when you don't know what you're doing. So let me show you what I mean with the oboe sound. So, so right here, this is a one band EQ, okay? And it's just a filter. And I can select this one here, which is a high pass filter. And you could see that from left to right are frequencies. From left is the lower frequencies, and this is 20 uh, kilohertz, and it goes up to over 10K, so that's 10,000 hertz. Uh, 20 hertz and up to 10,000 hertz. And the higher the number, the faster the vibrations. So frequencies are vibrations per second. That's how we measure them. A440, for example. Okay, great. So watch what happens as I've selected this high pass filter. And I'm going to just play the oboe and I'm going to sweep it from left to right. Right, I can really dramas dramatically change the sound with just this filter. So I want to make it just a little bit brighter, so I'm just going to attenuate some of the lower frequencies like that. And it's a very subtle difference. Now, let me do the opposite, all right? And let me cut off some of the... This is a low-pass filter if I wanted to make it darker. Right? It almost sounds a little muffled. So you have to be really careful with this stuff. And you also have this filter slope here. So watch what happens to this curve as I change it. So that's a gentler curve. So if I wanted to have something be a little warmer, but I want her to just, I just want to take a little bit of the low end off. Just a little bit. Now, if she was playing solo by herself, I would leave it alone but we want to make it fit in with the other instruments as a package, a whole complete system unit, a system of sound. All right. So I've taken a little bit of the low end off of that, and I'm going to listen to the bassoon. Now, with the bassoon... I want to take a little bit of the low end off also for this bassoon, but not for the other bassoon, right? Because it's playing bass line. So I'm just going to do a similar thing here.
and I'm just listening. And then I bypass it. See, it's a little woolly, the sound there. And I'm just correcting the room sound a little bit. See, for me right now, they fit in much nicer. And let's listen to the bass. This one I'm going to leave alone. And listen to the three of those together without the piano. So when I'm hitting this S button over here, I'm soloing it, and the M button is muting, so the piano is muted right now. Okay, so for me, the piano is a little dull. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to put a high pass filter. And I'm going to listen to that with the bass bassoon. Right, so I carved out some frequencies in the piano that are now occupied by the bassoon. I left space for him. If you were playing live, you would adjust your playing to the sound of the room and your playing technique to do that automatically. But we're doing this together in different room spaces, so we have to do a little bit of enhancement. Okay? Great. So what I want you to do is figure out how to add reverb in whatever DAW you're doing. Inside of Pro Tools, what I teach is to create something called an auxiliary track, which allows audio to be sent to it, but it, you can't record audio onto it. So I've got that set up here as an aux track, and I've got a reverb plug in here. And what I'll do is I'll go to the send and I will send a copy of that audio. And let me just mute these, zero these out. A copy of that audio to the reverb track. So, And I've also done something called solo safing it, which means that it will, whatever's going through there will always sound. So right now I'll solo the lead oboe and I will add the bus that I'm sending the reverb to and play the oboe. And I'm going to start out with adding too much reverb. Okay, so I've just picked a hall or a chamber. You can use a different kind of reverb. So if I mute this, just make this inactive, and I put in the bass Pro Tools reverb, which is D-verb. Not my favorite reverb in the world, but just to show that it works. And just use a preset. So what I'm going to use that sounds nice is a vocal plate, right? That's a certain kind of reverb. I know that it sounds decent in Pro Tools. It's one of their better reverbs. And what you want to do is play the sound, stop it, and listen to the tail, right? So if it's too much, which would be up here, you see how it takes over the sound? You just want it to give a little sense of space. And right about there. And same thing with the bassoon. So I know about where it is. It's somewhere in here. And maybe just a little bit less on the lower pitched instruments so it's not muddy.
So the bassoon was a little loud, I thought, so I brought it down a little bit more. And the piano is a little soft now when I'm hearing it with reverb and EQ, so I'm going to bring it up a little bit more. And now the only other thing to do is make sure your ending is tight. So let's show me how to do that. All right, so I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to select all of these areas here and delete them all in the same spot. Let me just get rid of this for just for the time being. And I'm going to create a fade that all ends at the same time. Just like that. So the oboe is holding on just a little bit longer. So I'm going to adjust that here. A little bit short, too short now. That's good. Now, when you're going to render this as an audio file to submit, you have to go a little bit past the end of your piece when you're selecting an area because the reverb tail continues on after the audio file ends. So I'm going to select a few seconds more, and I'm going to go to the very beginning here. Right? They all start at the same spot. We've got a little bit up front, and then I'm going to unsolo everything and I will bounce this to disc and you guys are going to send these around as mp3s so this is the uh, handle sonata mix date and my initials and you want to select 320 as your bit rate. That's the highest bit rate. It'll sound the best, the least compressed. And then you can add your tags. Um, Krista, Frank, Pete, ACSM Music, whatever you want to title that, and then those tags will show up. All right, and then you just bounce it to disk. And then if I go here, bounce to files, ch -ch -ch -ch. Beautiful, right? It's an honor for me to make music with these two people. Thank you so much, and I hope this has been helpful. Okay, so that's doing a classical piece. We're going to do a rhythm section piece in a minute. So we've got about another 20 minutes or so to this presentation. Um, so just to answer a question from Robert Freeman, if you're doing videos... You're all making videos on your phones. Somebody's going to have to take all those videos and you would just import the audio from those videos into your sequ your DAW. Make, make your mix, a stereo mix in the DAW, and then export that file. And then you would have to get somebody, I, I'm not a video editor, but you'd have to take the video files and import them into like Premiere or Final Cut Pro and set up a split screen if you want to have like a partridge, like a, you know, like a Zoom thing with everybody playing. And then you, you would line the players up with that mix that you did of the audio. So I would do those two things separately like that. All right. So what I'd like to do, um, Carlos, is let's just play the video of the, um, of the piece that I did with Dennis and Andy, which is a variation on I Got Rhythm. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about the mix after it's done. The next online collaboration, Professor McCrell, Dennis McCrell, and Professor Blanco, Andy Blanco, we are going to collaborate on a rhythm section track. So we've chosen I Got Rhythm as the basic foundation for the song. I created this click track at 120 beats per minute and I've sent it off to Dennis McCrell. Let's go to him and see what he's doing. My name is Dennis McCrell and I'm the drum set instructor from the jazz department at Queens College. 
First of all, you are in what was my garage. It was a single car garage. So imagine a long rectangle or like a shoebox with a moderately high ceiling. In order to make it fit to record in, I had to do a couple of things. Um, there is a carpet which stretches most of the entire length of the room because we have uh, hardwood floors. And so this takes care of a lot of the reflection. Behind me, uh, there are actually two layers of sheets. This sheet stretches from this wall all the way to the far wall. And the exact same thing is on the opposite uh, end of the room. Two sheets there, two sheets here, and a carpet. And that really does a lot to take care of uh, not not only the reflection that comes from uh, you know the sound bouncing off these hard surfaces, but also because you know my driveway is on the other side of that wall, so a lot of the uh, the traffic that may go through it kind of tends to soundproof the room a little bit as well. I'm going to use one microphone, one condenser microphone, which is going to be about three feet in front of the kit, and I'm also going to record a bass track using my Fender Precision plugged directly into my audio interface. Reaper is my software and I'm doing it on a Windows PC. I downloaded the tracks from the Google Drive and I've imported them into Pro Tools and I've taken his sync point here and lined that up at the beginning of bar two. So if we go to the big counter, you can see, all right, bar two. And you can see right here is bar two and that's his clap. So now let's take a listen. And everything lines up perfectly. It's well recorded. One microphone, you can really capture a lot of the drum. If you take a look at how he's placed it, right? It really captures all the instruments. And you could think of literally hundreds and hundreds of amazing records that were recorded with one microphone on the drum. I'm going to play piano on this. I don't need the click anymore because I've got this great drum track. So I'm going to take this portion of the click, either delete it. The audio doesn't get deleted. You can still drag it back out, but you just have removed it from the timeline. All I need is the count off so that I will know when to come in, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, boom, and then I'm in. I'm only having the count off up to the fill. I'm going to bounce this to disc and email it to myself. I'm going to play along with that MP3 on an iPad. I'm in my piano room now, and I'm going to lay down the piano part for this rhythm section track. I took the MP3 that I rendered, I emailed it to myself, and I've got it playing on my iPad here. You could have it on your phone. You could have it on your laptop. I have earbuds in, which is totally fine. And if you look up here, this time I'm using a little Zoom audio recorder and it's got microphones built in and maybe you have something like that. Just showing you a different technique. With this track, there's electric bass. So I'm taking the piano mic, I'm moving it a little bit to the right of middle C so that it does not emphasize my left hand. I'll play softer in my left hand, but I've got the mic set up so that it will help me when it comes to mix. It's literally two or three inches to the right of middle C. I'm going to do multiple takes and show you how to make one out of them. So I'm going to push this to play. I'm going to clap on the first beat of the second measure of click and just start recording. I've imported the piano audio, all three takes on one track into Pro Tools. And one thing I wanted to say about what Professor McCrell did is if you look here, he labeled this really well. I got rhythm, drum track, mic two with the date. Again, right here, same thing. So I know what everything is. It's easy to find, it's easy to keep organized. I had to rename the Zoom file when I got it onto my desktop. And so I named it Rhythm Piano. So let's find my clap points, let's see. All right, so it looks like these are my three takes. So I'm going to delete all this. And then Pro Tools has a little trick that will get me to the transient or my slap. And if I just hit the tab key, it goes right to the transient there. And I can just separate that out and delete that and then do the same thing here. 
and then do the same thing here. So I've now got three, and I don't need all this stuff at the end, so let me delete that. And I don't need that either. So I've got three different piano tracks. So let's just drag these all closer to the beginning of the piece right here. Let me show you how to make a comp track. So I need two new audio tracks, two, and I recorded the piano and stereo audio tracks. I'm going to name them both piano, and then I'll have to rename the second one. So let's just take this and drag it here take this and drag it here. So I've got my three takes and now I'm going to line up my, and I can do this with all three, my sync point, just like that. And then I'm going to listen to little sections with the drums and I'm going to mute the other tracks. So let's take it from right here and I'm going to select the best bits and make one track. Okay, I already don't like that. I don't like the second chord I hit on the G. I should hit a G minor, I hit a G7. Okay, so I like that up until the second bit. Let me just listen to the third take. I like it up to there. Separate that out. I'm going to mute this for the time being. So I like that part. Let's listen to this to this guy. I like that. And I'm going to mute this. So you should learn how to mute your tracks. On Pro Tools, you separate out the area you want to mute and you hit Command M. I don't like that. Let's listen to the first track again at that point. Ah, do that chromatic thing there. I don't like that. Let's do this. Let's separate this out and let's unmute this one. Much better. Again, with that doo 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 doo. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't like that now that I'm listening back. So let's take it from here. I don't like that either. So let's listen to this one from there. I like that, so let's do this. So we're going to separate this here, and we're going to mute all this. Uh, that's fine. Let's continue on to the solo now. that so let's see so we're going to mute all of this so far I like that. Let me just, uh, I just want to hear the last eight on the other takes. I like that end though. 
better than the one I did up here. So I'm just going to separate this out and mute this. And I think I've got a nice piano track now. Well, it'd help if I unmuted it. end button is much better on that take. There are a bunch of ways to comp things together. Some people have different playlists that can live under a track and they expand that and they create one track from that. But this is a quick way to do it where I don't have to teach you too much. So I'm going to select this entire area from bar one all the way to the end of the piano bit. And I'm going to make this into one track and import it back into Pro Tools. Let me drag this up here. And there is our entire piano track. What I'll do with these tracks is hide them and make them inactive. I've got my click up front. Now I'm going to bounce this entire bit from bar one. Here's the behind the scenes look at my recording setup for Professor Calandra's Q class. I have a large diaphragm condenser mic. It's an SE4400A uh, microphone about three feet above the vibraphone in the center. And that is connected to a Focusrite Sapphire Pro digital interface, which is over here on the rack. And I have that connected to a an external hard drive for all my recording projects. And I have a logic session opened up with the tracks that Professor Calandra sent me. Andy Blanco sent me the files he created and he did a great job with this. And I wanna just point out a few things before we start deconstructing the mix. And I'll talk about that in a second. So he's got his sync point here in both tracks. And you notice that even though the tambourine doesn't start until measure 19, he made an audio file from his logic session that started at the very beginning of the piece all the way to the end. The end part doesn't really matter as much as everything starting from bar one, beat one. So if you're going to use a DAW, whether it's GarageBand, Audacity, Reaper, Logic, or whatever you use, when you're shooting files back and forth between the different DAWs, it all works fine as long as you just import things in from the beginning. And I'm not going to play what Andy did. We're going to go to a live presentation of me showing you how I mix this track. Okay, so just a few minutes with this. So I'm going to play this track dry. And now I'm going to add all the treatment I did. Whoops. Okay, so I think it sounds, for an online collaboration, I think it sounds great, really. Everybody plays well, it's well recorded, and I'm going to go over, a f we're running long, so I'm just going to go over a few of the more salient things I did here. And the first thing is that you really want to 
even things out in the tracks. So, so right here, that crash is was at this um, level. Right, that's way too loud. So I did that same trick where I separated out the clip and I did clip-based gain. You alternative, alternative, oops, excuse me. Alternatively, you could bring the volume down using a tr some sort of trim tool. And I went through the whole track and I found spots where the crash was too big. Um, he did a, open hi-hats tend to cut through a mix really, really loud. So for example, coming up here, right? That open hi-hat there. If I were to um, zero that out, see how it sticks out like that? So you want to make it sound smooth. And you do that with volume. And I did the same thing with the bass. And you want to get your volumes between the bass and the drums set right. So I have it set here on this part to minus 2.6. So I'm going to make it too loud, right? So you see how the bass takes over the drums there? So right here, you still hear the bass, but you can still hear the kick drum. And quickly on the drums, I did a little bit of fancy EQ. I just ducked up right at this point, but I did a high pass filter right here, just a little sheen on the top. And that would have been fine if that's all you did. And with the bass, I actually just boosted some of the low end. So that's a little bit different than what I spoke about before, but just try to stay simple with EQ. And then the other thing that's different about this track here is that I inserted reverb right directly into the track. So let me show you this. This column here is an insert. So if you think of like an electric guitar, a cable and a guitar amp, the sound starts in the guitar, goes through the cable and comes out the guitar amp. If you plug a foot pedal into that line between the guitar and the amplifier, you take the output of the guitar, you insert the jack into, let's say it's an echo pedal, and you take the output of the echo pedal and you insert it into the amplifier and you create, you can add echo to your guitar part sound. It's the same thing here. Signal flow, that's a, 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 we spend a lot of time with that in my classes, but I'm inserting reverb in the track. This is the way Logic defaults. They, if you open up a track, they'll have all the plugins in it. It's, it's a little bit insane from my perspective, but I guess it helps out people that are just beginning, except that everything ends up sounding the same, which is another discussion. So if you look at here, right, I'm going to mute the reverb. Put it in. Right. So it's doing two things. It's adding some, he's got one microphone, right? It's adding some width in the stereo field, which you can't hear on Zoom, but I can hear it in my headphones here. And if you notice, right here is the dry and wet. So dry means no reverb and wet means all reverb. So I've got it set for 30% wet. So I'm going to make it too wet and you'll hear the difference in the sound. Right? No. And again, I have a very short decay on this. And I'm using a, what's called a plate reverb. So plate reverbs are really good. And then let's look at the vibes for a second. Right, so see I've got a high pass in there. And I've got some reverb. And then with piano, high pass, and a little bit of reverb.
I use similar reverb plate on each one of them. So that's another thing you have to be careful of if you're inserting reverb is to not have a cathedral, a small room, a plate reverb, a chamber, a different type of reverb in every instrument. That's one reason why use, learning how to use Ascend to an, an AUGS track creates a more unified piece. And that's typically how things were done in old school recording studios. So we're way over and we've gone through a lot of stuff. Uh, no, I did not use a gate on the piano, uh, Latoya. Yes. It depends. So, uh, right. So Dr. Smaldone is asking, um, if once the first reference track is recorded, do the musicians need or want the click or do they prefer with just the first track? So in this particular bit, uh, I sent a, the dentist play to the click. He sent it back to me. I only had the click on the count off and then I turned it off and I played to the drums. Right. And then with the classical piece, I left the click in but I turned it way down so that it was just audible enough for them to hear it if they really wanted to find where the time was. So each, each situation is a little bit unique. Um, if you have somebody playing a very strong rhythmic part as the base of your recording, so let's say you're playing a piano piece and the piano player is playing a, something with a pulse all the way through, you could give that person the click and they could play to the click or or you could just give them a count off and they could play from the count off on with their own time. And then the other players can use the count off so that they know when to come in and play along with the pianist as the reference. You need something that's your reference and your base with which you can, everybody can, it's their pivot point. It's their fulcrum, right? So yeah, that answers that. Any other questions out there? Questions, questions, questions. Questions 67 and 68. <laughs> that's an old school reference. Okay, so um, I think that's it from my perspective. I know we've gone on quite a bit, but it's a it lot. Great. It's, 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 um, it's a lot to absorb. There's so much to teach, and I'm just trying to give you some ideas. Maybe you can go refer to this on YouTube when it's up, um, and uh, hopefully this will help you guys out. You should all take my technology class, one of them at least, and you'll learn much more about this stuff. I, I agree, actually. We'll we'll post that up uh, when it comes times to when it when it comes time to register, so people are a little more aware of it. Um, that's great, Pete. One, Thank one, you one so thing, much. I yeah. to Professor Callis. So um, for the classical piano, right? There's so many ways to to mic a piano. I wanted to do something that was easy. I didn't want to open my piano lid because it is a seven and a half foot piano and we're playing, you know, music that should be played on a harpsichord. So I left the lid down and I put the piano, the microphone. Um, if this is the piano keyboard here, I put the microphone on the other side of the piano rack and I didn't angle it straight down at the piano. I angled it a little bit off towards almost just a down a little bit because then the sound comes up from the hammers and it's off axis, which means it'll be a little bit thinner sound, which is more appropriate, I think, for that style of music. But I, I used a stereo setting on the Yeti and make sure that you're, one, one thing I wanted to say, I forgot to say, I can't believe I did this. Before you record, play something soft, play something loud, record it, make sure you're not distorting, adjust your level so that you get, it's not in the red, very important, okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, I had heard Pete. I have a question. What, what Pete? I could I could bring my dog in here. <laughs> oh, oh, you hear my dog. Sorry. Uh, I was just gonna <laughs> ask, somebody told me that it's good to have some carpet behind the microphone as well and in front of you. So like it's on both sides. It depends upon your room and what you're trying to do. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it definitely helps. You know, they make those reflection filters, they're called. They're like little, little, um, they're almost like a cone of silence to reference Get Smart that goes around the back of the microphone and it cuts off a lot of the reflection from this side of the mic and the sides of the mic. So yes, you could have a carpet or something on, on this side of the microphone. Um, if you have a music stand, 
I would uh, also put like a towel on the music stand to stop the reflections off the metal music. If you've got one of those Manhasset metal music stands, uh, they, they definitely reflect the metal on that reflects really horribly. In at the college, we, we put on a, a, a towel. We have a few towels that we drape over those when we're recording um, people reading music off of them. Yeah, so everybody knows we're going to put this on the ACSM website with a link so people can refer to this. And if you can tell your friends and students and whatnot, um, you know, it, it, they, everybody should watch this. I think that we should put the, uh, the, the pre-recorded video, since you have them, on three separate uploads as, long, as well as the long form video of this. This way people can access what they need. But then, yeah, sure. Jane and, and Carlos, can we, we'll talk about that tomorrow and we'll figure out how to get up there. Uh, thanks, Pete. Thank you so much for doing this. This was just, as usual, fantastic. Thanks to Professor Morelli, uh, Professor Robinson, Matt Krell, and Andy Blanco, Professor Blanco, for helping out with this. And, and of course, Pete. Of course, you. Um, uh, we're going to have another event. It's going to probably be like a week off, and then we're going to come back and have we have a whole bunch of guest artists. Imani Win Quintet is coming uh, to give a presentation. There are some uh, Kupferberg Center events coming up. You should check out. So um, it should be exciting. We have a lot of good stuff. Pete, thank you so very much. Thanks again to Jane and to Carlos, as usual, who do a great job of managing and organizing these. Um, have a good weekend, everybody. If it's a holiday, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pete.